PD and as you said, also valuing people's time. So I chatted with Kate about this. So I have some slides, but I'm gonna keep, you know, with some information and some links that can be followed up, but I'm also gonna keep pausing and we're a small enough group that we can just talk, you know, so please, you know, just um, interject, uh, you know, tell me to stop, um, you know, whatever, this can be a conversation as much as anything, but I do have slides just so that I can remember what the key points are. Um, so if that's okay, I will share my screen. Do you, so do you mind if I do that just for, it'll just be for a period of time and then we can come back and have all our faces for a chat. Okay, I'll share my screen. Where am I here? Is that showing? Yeah. Yes. Yep, very okay. clearly, very well. All right, I'm gonna try and get my chat up as well. Sorry. Okay, and Kate, if I miss anything in the chat, you might let me know, okay? Perfect. So I think I'm just gonna pause on this first slide because this uh, the title I came up with with Kate talking about what tonight could be and we decided to call it Open Education for Good. So, I mean, I would just love to know what, you know, is there any kind of, big issue or question or something that you are interested in exploring tonight, or is there something that you want to share? Um, you know, is there anything particular that you'd like to make sure that we talk about tonight in this precious time that we have? You can, you can Open speak to learn. Can type it in the Open chat. Open to learning anything. Open to learning anything. Okay. <laughs> That's lovely. Is there anything particular about open that's on your mind at the moment? I, I think Catherine, the the other sort of dark horse in, in, in the air at the moment, AI, how important openness is going to be in yep. the next couple of years while we all find our feet in this new world. Yeah. Thanks, Max. Yeah. My own thought for what it's worth is there's a, there's a considerable distance between the language of open that we're seeing and hearing, you know, and the, the, the lived realities of it. And I think it applies to an awful lot of things in education generally. But yeah. this one seems to really bring that one, that, that issue to the surface. You know, yeah. uh, a lot of people are very happy to talk about open and to embrace um, the discourse. And, but uh, but the, the actual walking the walk is not always that easy. I'm finding that myself now in a couple of projects I'm involved in, but yeah, but so very interested to hear other people's thoughts and comments on it. Great, thanks, Connor. Ira, I hear you I, about seeing and hearing. I, I, that's partly why I'm here as well. <laughs> but education is a lifespan constant and it has to be open. I, okay. I think that's one of the 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 big the big things and and. You know, I think, <laughs> you know, I still do a great deal with people with disabilities. And I always talk about everything we do having to be sustainable because the world will keep changing. Um, kids, as they grow, won't necessarily have the money to do big formal things. And so how do you keep everything open and available to people while still... Um, sort of ensuring some level of quality that goes with it is the you know it, it's the battle um and institutions as soon as they get established tend to want to close down mm -hmm. to protect themselves yep seen a lot of that yeah thanks ira Okay, um, all right, I'll get started and we can go quickly through some things if they're not interesting or we can dwell on particular issues like AI if that's of interest. I I, I just wanna say that my slides are an open educational resource um, as I always do. So I have some links to various things in here. So if you want to save the slides, um, that's where the slides are and then all of the sources are hyperlinked here. So. The whole presentation is an OER and you're welcome to use it, use bits of it, adapt it or whatever, um, however you like. Um, and 
we'll talk about licenses in a few minutes, but the license I'm using is CC by NC, and I'll talk about why I chose that um, in a few minutes. So the um, if anybody needs that, maybe Kate or someone would stick it in the chat, if you don't mind. Thank you, Kate. I should have done that. Um, this, the few slides that I put together was just, you know, what is an introduction just about where we are at the moment and why I feel um, like many of you do that open is not just important, but increasingly important right now. Um, kind of what is open education, the nuts and bolts of it, and, and then why. And again, that why I think is increasingly important. And, you know, I don't end up in discussions oftentimes about the nuts and bolts of open licensing with people, but often it's the why, you know, why is it so important that this particular work be open? And, and so I, I think that's what I'm particularly interested in. And then this whole notion of open education for good, we can, we can chat about that. So I just have one slide here just to make sure that we don't forget to acknowledge, you know, the times that we're living in and the peril that so many people are in at the moment. And for me, that's really connected with open education. I mean, I've been working in open education for maybe 15 years now, and it's always been really motivating for me, you know, that notion of access for all or, you know, in increasing at least access for people and furthering equity um, and enhancing pedagogy. But you know, with all that's going on in the world right now, war, increasing inequality, and so on. Um, it's really important to recognize that the work that we do in opening educational opportunity is really connected um, to opportunities for people. So in the last two years, for example, I've, I'm aware of, you know, a lot of work that's been done around helping Ukrainian refugees to further their education through open educational resources. Librarians all across Europe you know, banded together to do that. Um, the universities in Gaza um, don't exist anymore. Um, and there's, uh, again, an initiative to make OER available so students who are enrolled in Gaza and universities can further their education in some sense, um, if they're able to at all. So this is ongoing all the time by librarians, educators, um, citizens, you know, concerned people everywhere. So it's, I think it's important to keep, keep that connection um, so if you're concerned about, you know, all, all that's going on now, open education is, you know, is a, is a really important place to kind of address some of those concerns in a practical way as an educator. Um, in terms of the, the what of open education, there's so many different definitions. I particularly like this one by Bridget Vizina and Cable Green from um, Creative Commons, and they published this definition during the COVID crisis. And about open education is not a short-term fix to a passing problem. It's a long-term solution to ensuring equitable, inclusive access to effective educational resources and learning opportunities. And I like this because it really reinforces that it's not a binary. It's not like, is this open or is it closed? It's just an ongoing process of opening, um, you know, providing access, making educational resources available, enhancing learning opportunities and so on. And of course, the the most uh, popular face of open education is OER, open educational resources, which I know you all know about. Um, I, I'm not, I won't go into this in a whole lot of detail. We talk about the five R's, you know, once something is made an open educational resource, you can retain it, you can reuse it, you can revise it, remix it and redistribute it. So this is contrary to a lot of the, you know, the culture of ownership of, you know, intellectual property, particularly in universities. But it's very much in sync with the whole notion of education as sharing, which you know many of us um, espouse. Uh, I know from my time with you all in EdChat IE and all of, all of the work that we've done in SESI and so on. Um, in terms of the definition, I highlight a couple of pieces of this definition. This is like the UNESCO definition of OER. So it's anything, teaching, learning, and our research materials. So it can be a photograph that you share it on Flickr. It can be a whole textbook. It can be a course. It can be an assignment. It can be a blog post, you know, so the granularity uh, can be, you know, absolutely anything. But the key things are that it either resides in the public domain or it's under copyright and you put an open license on it. Um, and that license permits access, reuse, repurpose, adaptation and redistribution by others. And probably one of the biggest questions that I get from people is the relationship between an open license and copyright. And 
the way I usually describe it is that, you know, nothing happens to your copyright when you have something, but the open license sits on top of it. So wherever it travels in the world, wherever anybody finds that Flickr photo or assignment or whatever, they immediately know what they can do with it. They don't have to contact you. So I have a couple of slides just about uh, the kinds of organizations that use different Creative Commons licenses. Is it worth going through those? Uh, or is everybody well-versed in CC licenses and what do you think? Go ahead, Mag says. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. All right. I'll go ahead and um, you can, I can speak really fast because I'm from the Bronx IRA. <laughs> so if it's, if I'm too slow, you can tell me to speed right up. Okay. So you know, Creative Commons, you know, they very cleverly used the, the copyright icon and put two C's in it um, for their icon. So it's very noticeable. Most people know what Creative Commons looks license looks like, but sometimes there can be confusion about all the different terms within a Creative Commons license. So basically every Creative Commons license has the CC and then one or more of these four terms and you can kind of cluster them together to make um, specific licenses. So the by, CC by, means that, you know, if you use this, this thing that I created, all I'm asking with a CC by license is that you give me attribution. So it's like, um, it's like academic referencing. So you can use my thing, you can translate it to another language, you can adapt it using a different way, but just provide attribution to me as the creator. The SA term tacked onto the license means I want you to share alike. So you can use it, um, you, I want you to attribute me, but you have to use this same license. Um, you can't, you know, use a different license when you share your new thing um, based on my work. Non-commercial and not, no derivatives are very self-explanatory. I think non-commercial means that you can't take the work that I've done, like this presentation, for example, and then package it up and charge someone for it. And no derivatives means you can only use it in the form that I created it in. So there's not unlimited versions of Creative Commons license. There are in essence CC0, which is just public domain. And then there's six little combinations of the licenses. And I'll talk about this um, in relation to education. So these are listed from least restrictive to most restrictive. And I put a yellow box around the four that are usually used in education. So although there are many licenses, educators pretty much use one of these four. So it actually makes it a little bit simpler. You'll notice that I grayed out the ones at the bottom, the ones that have no derivatives in it, because most of the people who use no derivative licenses are artists, uh, photographers, um, people who you know maybe produce an artwork or something that they just don't want anybody to change how it looks. Whereas in educational content, one of the reasons we're sharing it is because we're permitting people to translate it or use it in a different way or add different examples. So we usually leave out those non-derivative licenses. So CC BY is the least restrictive. And then as you add more terms, they get slightly more restrictive, but they're still, you know, all of them are widely used in education. And this is where I, I, I'll pause and just open up the floor because I just think it's useful to look at how different organizations use some of these. So, you know, a lot of music, museums around the world, this is just a handful of them, um, are making their um, cultural content available with public domain, CC0 licenses. So Reich's Museum, the Paris Museums, the Smithsonian, the Hunt Museum has, um, has offered some of their content available with CC0 licenses. And then we get into like the education field. So the National Forum, everything the National Forum produced was published with a CC BY license. And that was very intentional. National Forum, publicly funded body to support all the higher education institutions in Ireland public funding, it's available to everybody. The Wellcome Trust uses a CC BY license. Wikipedia and Wikimedia use the BY SA license. Um, and then All Aboard is an example of a, an educational resource created by um, one university. They use the NC license. They don't want anybody charging for it. And I'm just gonna have an ellipsis here. There's all kinds of other resources. So I'm just gonna stop talking. And if anybody wants to add anything, ask anything, share a resource, please do. Ah, can you say more, Max? Is your mic on? 
it's a fatal mistake. Sorry, I'm d- fatal, fatal, <laughs> fatal error, fatal error. Hit the wrong button. Yeah, I, I see the Rijksmuseum there because I know they I, I know they have um absolutely everything is is public domain. And I've been wondering recently a lot about the book of Kells because I pass through Kells a lot and we mm. often talk about it and the the recent drama in Trinity has mm. brought the the curation of the book of Kells to mind. I don't know if the actual mm. images in the book of Kells are I'm going to go and find out now. Are they public? Great. Even though the, the book itself is, I know the book itself is a huge earner for mm-hmm. Trinity. And I think it was your man who gave it to the brother. Um, Oliver Cromwell might have given it to the brother at some stage. But I'm going, I am going to make it my job to find out what the CC on the Book of Kells is. I think you you know that that's a great thing to find out, and I would love to know. The Reichs Museum is really interesting. I I saw a presentation of theirs about six years ago. They were one of the first museums, and they said they just got tired of seeing all these really poor reproductions of like the Night Watchman and everything yeah. on, on the internet. And they thought we will make high quality images available of all our artwork. So anyone, and you know, as educators, that's great for us. You know, we can have students engage with cultural content in this you know open way. Um, and remix it and you know use it for all sorts of things but anyway i'll be quiet again if anybody else wants to add anything could i throw something in catherine yes okay i'm working with a a small polytechnia institute in portugal whose one third of its funding line comes as its status as an ngo and we're working on building a second brain which is a short advanced program under Run EU, a funded line where students learn things that they wouldn't normally learn in their academic semesters as third or fourth year students. And the issue we're encountering is uh, tight constraints financially on how much the students can be aided with things like software licenses. Now, it's become easier since we first started setting it up because it's the B- the BASB, the splitting a second brain, is based on um, the use ethical use of AI. And then the AIs that we wanted to use have become free with mm-hmm. packages. So GPT is inside of GPT uh, or Omni GPT, which now gives them the latitude they the need to actually do the stuff we have set up. So my point, I guess my question is this, <clears throat> have you thought about making kind of seeking out um, like you're doing uh, people who are trying to impose on or percolate into things like what I'm talking about, the the open education ethos, because we will attract young students who are from financially difficult situations. We'll get the last one I did. We had a woman from Uzbekistan, somebody whose parents told her to leave Hungary and go to Finland to get her education because the premier in Hungary is a bit difficult. And then yesterday, just accidentally, I discovered 14 students from University of Texas at Arlington who are in Dublin and they're actually there with the Goolsby Leadership Academy. And the point is, they that academy, uh, I'm not sure more about, about the foundation mm-hmm. elements of it, but based, the students were the closest to Rhodes Scholars I'd ever seen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> they were friendly and they were affable, and they were actually the next generation of OER proponents, but they don't know of which you speak. And I, I did wrong by not kind of bringing it into the fore and saying the information we're using is amalgamated and is an open education resource. So back to the question, or how have, how are you, besides knowing that EdChat IE and the people in this call are of the same mental framework that you would have, how do you personally seek out organizations or initiatives and say, look, I'm going to infuse this value that you're speaking about tonight with this organization or with, this, with, this, with these people? Because mm-hmm. I know I'm feeling it with Portugal, mm-hmm. and I'm also feeling it now unexpectedly with UTA, and yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to bring I <clears throat> hope to actually figure out a way to bring have them bring their next cohort not to Dublin but to one of the regions maybe in the Galway which I know they love or in the Clonmel which I know Clonmel would love if I can only sort accommodation for them at a reasonable price. Mm-hmm. But how would you do that? Because you're doing it now as a the Pied Piper of OER. Uh, you know, what goes through your head to figure out, all right, are these worth my time? Are they chancers? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, do you just say, I have a rate card and say thousand euro, or you say, I have a rate card, but since you're a CC group, I'm Catherine, who, how are you? How do you do it? Because you have a good filter. Um, 
I, I, I've done it and, and continue to do it at different layers. So when I was teaching, you know, even in, in IT courses, I, I layered this in as a key digital literacy that students mm -hmm. needed to understand. It's not rocket science, just needed to understand the basics of open licensing. If you use something that's just from Google, you know, that's contravening copyright law. There's problems with copyright law. You know, you can talk about all these things, mm -hmm. but that they left with an understanding of what open is and could bring that wherever they were going. In the National Forum, we tried to, the, my whole job was trying to build open capabilities across the higher education sector and taking people where they were and infusing it in everything the National Forum did. And part of that is, um, there's, there's a page that's, you know, if you click that hyperlink there that says National Forum, that's the page of all the resources that anybody can use if you're supporting students, fellow lecturers or teachers, whatever, in understanding open. There's a whole suite of CC BY licensed material there. Um, the other thing is just modeling it. Like I've learned over time the power of modeling it. Like if you're talking about it and the light bulb goes on for people and then you say, look at my website, everything on there is CC licensed. Look at this presentation, this presentation is CC. And then people really understand the value. And then since I stopped working full time in an, in an educational organization, which I did two years ago and I'm working independently, I'm working for part of my time with community groups, because I saw that was a huge gap, particularly during COVID. Lots of community groups put materials online and didn't really, you know, barely understood kind of digitally what was required, but didn't really understand things like privacy, openness, licensing. So I've worked with the Galway Traveler Movement and with some um, ecology-minded organizations, um, um, Green Sod Trust, um, and really, it's it's usually a very short amount of time you work with them. Just like, show me what you're doing. Show me what you're sharing. Who are you sharing with it? You teach them about open licenses and then they run. And they're, you know, one group was sharing their materials with other groups in Spain and France. Um, Swift, Swift Ireland about, about um, making nesting boxes for Swifts. And they have these great materials and they were sharing them with other countries. And now they put an open license on them. So if anybody finds them online, they know they can translate them and do whatever they want. So I really want to work more with nonprofit and community organizations who are doing such amazing work anyway. Um, but yeah, so all, all different levels, Bernie. But let me just add one thing to that because the, this goal, these Goolsby people, if I bring them over, the goal is I'm gonna to try to immerse them into adopting one of our festival festivals. We have a Junction Arts Festival. We have a When Next We Meet Festival. We have an Apple Fest. And trying to give them, try to stick in some of the stuff we teach for um, cultural communications and leadership, give them some of those academic tools while also having them work with festival organizers at the voluntary community level. And the, the people in this, the UTA students, they're, they want to be CPAs, that they're business accountancy students, they're all carrying at least a 3.5 GPA, and they're clever. I stuck in the chat Karen Lynch's name. I don't know if you yeah, know him. I don't. Community engagement partners. Uh, he he's he oozes this community ethos. He doesn't mention open education resources or Creative Commons material. He should. Mm -hmm. And I need to talk to Karen next time when he when I hear him in a place because I mean he's an affable friar, <laughs> and and really knows the space. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he's working exactly the space you're talking about, uh, traveler communities, uh, respect for diversity, uh, but making them survivable by giving them an institutional ethos, protecting them with articles of association and uh, standards that will meet the highest level of, in of inspection when it comes to financial um, regulation. Okay, Bernie, thank you. I mean, I will say, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember who brought up AI at the start. I mean, this, this is an issue now. There are live conversations going on where people are saying, okay, Creative Commons licensing is great, but the companies like OpenAI are basically going in and just, you know, hoovering up the web and contravening copyright law and so on. You know, they may or may not be held to account for that. But in the meantime, Creative Commons and others are looking at ways to nuance Creative Commons licenses, you know, give people an opportunity to opt out, um, give you know a, a lot of um indigenous groups 
uh, who want to share their work but don't want to share all of their work, you know, want to find different ways to attribute people, that there isn't just one owner for Indigenous knowledge, you know, there are multiple owners. So there's all kinds of interesting things going on. But in that soup of, of, of change that we're living through, these are still some things that we can hold on. You know, these licenses will carry forward and it's a way um, of asserting that you want to share and how you want to share what you're doing. And, you know, I think when I'm working with organizations, it's really useful to be able to say to someone who's a bit reluctant, well, hey, the Wellcome Trust uses this license. You know, the Smithsonian uses this license. The National Forum uses this license. You know, it's good to have examples. I have found that useful. I also think it's, you know, I mean, Copyright's an interesting thing because people steal copyrighted materials all the time and, and yeah. reuse them badly. So <laughs> copyright might make you some money, although it never has for me. So I don't know about that. But <laughs> but um, it's I think people sometimes think, oh, this is you know, that's an absolute protection, but it's not. And one of the things is you're. Um, I think the uh, the argument is you're um, you're creating something that has a much higher level of reality in the world these days. That you're saying yes, you can take this, but just say mm -hmm. who you got it from, or because people will do that anyway. And one of the you know the I think one of the biggest things for me in this whole process is academic stuff. What I love about the book you put together, Catherine, you and the group put together, is that, um, you know, so often you're trying to distribute knowledge, but you're blocked by, you know, the cost of these journals or people aren't on, you, you know, they're not actively in a university community and they can't get to it and things. And that is such a destructive force it lets misinformation flow much more directly because misinformation is usually not protected and so i'm just trying to think of all the arguments we have for saying um you know you have better choices than copywriting things you know yeah, I, yeah. But... I, I i i i agree with that completely uh ira and I mean, I could just zoom forward. I have a couple of slides about the why, because we seem to be talking about the why here now. So I can go forward to those and then we can just open it up for discussion again. If that's is that okay? Yep. Okay. Because all, all of this, you know, all of this whole discussion about licenses is about the stuff that we share, but it's not really about how we teach and how we learn and how we share. But it's still really important, I think, to understand this, these, as I say, the nuts and bolts of OER. But again, the, you know, education isn't just about educational materials, it's about how we teach and open education isn't just about OER, it's about open educational practices as well. So that is includes, you know, getting students to interact. Bernie and I used to, you know, 10 years ago, we had our students sharing with students in Spain and New Zealand and the UK and everything because we were opening our work and getting the students to interact with each other. So there's a whole host of advantages to open educational practices. So when I talk about why open, I kind of tend to distill it into these three areas. And again, this is just from lots of conversations over the years about trying to explain the benefits, potential benefits, I should say, of open. So I, I call those three areas basically access, equity, and pedagogy. So access is self-explanatory. It's, you know, when people talk about OER, they're generally talking about access. But who are we talking about access to? So we're talking about, obviously, students. You know, if we have open textbooks or open open educational resources, they don't have to buy something so they have, can access educational materials. We can share our things with fellow educators. You know, something we've developed can, you know, I've developed something where Kate can use it. She can use it with a different group of people. And so we can support learning. And then there's just so many people who will never access higher education, may, you know, may want to learn beyond secondary education. So again, anyone who wants to learn further and has access and meaningful connectivity can benefit from, you know, open educational resources. So access is key. Equity, 
again, self-explanatory, but a, a few key things, reducing costs for students so they don't have to pay for expensive textbooks, the notion of persistent availability of resources, like particularly during COVID, lots of students had to take breaks from higher education. And during those breaks, you know, they don't have institutional email, they don't have access to their library. Um, when students move on from either secondary or third level education, they might lose access to all those systems. So if you're using OER for teaching, they have all those resources and can continue to use them. Um, we've all taught with textbooks that are really not geared to the students that are in the learning space with us. You know, they were, they were written by American authors and we're teaching here in Ireland or um, they don't address LGBTQ issues or whatever it might be, traveler issues. So if we're using OER for learning materials, we can weave in and make those materials meaningful for the students with whom we're working. And then they're just open for all, as I said, people who will never um, move forward in education can, can benefit or formal education can benefit from OER. And it supports the sustainable development goals, of course. And then pedagogy is just all the interesting ways you can teach. As I talked about that example I did with Bernie, you can adapt them OER, students can create them, students can create open resources as their assessments so they can create things with and for communities that are meaningful to them. Um, they can contribute to public knowledge. They can, learning about open licensing, as I said, is develops digital and data literacies. Um, adaptable for neurodiverse needs. Thank you, Ira. Um, we can diversify the curriculum and enable all forms of uh, local and global collaboration. Um, I'm just going to flick forward because I, I really want to have time for discussion. So I'm just going to flick forward a few slides. I mentioned open textbooks, and I just want to talk about, again, that it's not just a matter of having them open or closed. Um, there's different levels of... Um, social justice defined by Nancy Fraser and others. So these are kind of three things to think about if you're developing OER or open, in this example, open textbooks. So you can be addressing economic justice if you just take an existing textbook and make it available openly. That's great. Students don't have to pay the cost of the textbook. You can address cultural injustice by redesigning for those without access in mind. So re designing for those with neurodiverse needs, you know, UDL is an example of, of, of designing for diverse needs. Um, designing with case studies and examples that focus on, you know, women or Irish examples or, you know, LGBTQ communities or whatever that might be. And then the third level is addressing political injustice, actually involving those who typically don't have access in the design and development of that open textbooks or open resource. So even those of us who've been doing this for a long time, it's like peeling the layers of an onion. There's always ways that we can, you know, address further levels of injustice and in, in when we're doing our open work. And this, I'll just end after this for now. Um, last week I had, two weeks ago, I was the great pleasure, Ira knows this, of going to Lehman College in the Bronx. And, you know, the City University of New York addresses the, you know, um, underserved communities all across New York City and Lehman College with very few resources is doing amazing work and two of the uh, librarians there wrote this great article about um, the intersection of open education and equity pedagogy so if anybody wants to explore I definitely recommend their work so you know the last couple of slides I have is just about the book Higher Education for Good and how that intersects with open education I can flick through those or I can just stop and then and then pause for chatting, is that okay? All right, I'll do two minutes. Pardon? Yeah, I'd say go through quickly. Okay, go through and then I'll stop the slides and we can see each other. So we published, uh, Laura uh, Chernuich and myself published this book after like a two year um, effort. Lou, who's here, is, and Kate, who's here, are two of the authors whose work is in the book. Am I missing anybody? No, I think that's it. Um, we just started with that notion of despair about what was happening in the world that encapsulated by that fragmentation in the first image I showed and thought, 
what could we do? We were both leaving formal jobs in higher education. We were like, what could we do now that we're not constrained by the by organizations that would be meaningful? So we we just put the call out to educators globally about how could we explore better futures for higher education. The book is an OER. <laughs> it has a CC by NC license. Um, it's if you just search higher education for good, you'll find it. Um, I always like to show this slide because if I'm talking about the book, I like to bring Laura into the room. So <laughs> there's Laura. Um, we were just the co-editors. The authors were from multiple countries. We made a great effort that it would be really, you know, global north, global south, um, as many places as we could access. 71 authors, 27 chapters. And we tried over two years to create a community of authors. People peer reviewed each other's work and you know, in work that had inspired us in, in climate justice, for example, we really admired work that didn't just diagnose the problem, but tried to identify avenues for action and hope. So we tried to do that in this book. And it has links with open education. I won't I won't spend time on this. We can talk more in the Q&A. Um, we wrote this at the end of the book. So I'll end with this just about, uh, despite all the problems, just that we're quite hopeful. So we believe that hope is firmly rooted in the belief that it is never too late Hope is practical, it means taking action, it means being disciplined, making plans. Hope is impractical, it means dreaming, being undisciplined, being open-ended. Hope is strengthened when practiced in solidarity tonight with others. It means building and strengthening alliances, coalitions, communities. Hope is contested and contradictory, and yet whatever its form, it is essential. Without hope, there would be no future worth living. So we hope that the book is, um, is practical and also maybe a little arrow towards hope. And that is it. I will stop sharing. Last word to James Baldwin. So that's a that's a, a messy Catherine Cronin view of open education, but I'm happy to hear what you all think. Just say sorry, I got booted off there. Uh, typically, with my connection towards the end, I would just say thank you, Catherine, for um, for that quick, I suppose, quick tour because of the nature of the people that are in the room and the familiarity with open. But maybe that that structure that we need to address some of the questions for this conversation. So, if anyone does want to come in, I certainly invite anyone that maybe has been lurking in the background and like would like to come on and have their say. I'd like Page. just to say my signal dropped three times during the period that I was supposed to be online there, but I got most of it. Very interesting. Thank you. I'll say that now in case the signal goes again. I'm not putting my mug shot up. That we, <laughs> we won't risk that. Mm -hmm. I understand fully, Elizabeth. <laughs> yes. Fellow female. Your pain. <laughs> Thank you. And I know Lou, you tried to come in, and Bernie has his hand up. So yeah, it's, uh, it's if I could just just mention it because I, I what I did, I want to make sure it didn't uh, desecrate the book. So Catherine, we uh, discovered the Moorish Library had the book, so we ordered another copy. Since I told them we were going to actually read the book, uh, and I gave it to students with a specific remit on certain chapters that folded into a module I teach called Emerging Trends and Technology. And um, what I had them do is uh, use the technology that was new to them, Microsoft Copilot, Perplexity.ai, and, and uh, ChatGPT, to actually query the premises the authors had. And I said, I'm very specifically interested in, are the, are the sources offered in the bibliographies by the authors authentic to the purpose of the chapter or are the accessories to it? So that meant that they had to actually occasionally go deep on 20 or 30 references uh, using the AI. And then they discovered that most of those sources were actually inside the corpus of the AIs, which is interesting, which then reveals the issue that people at the yeah. start of this discussion were saying, look, how much has been hoovered or how much is behind paywalls. Um, and then I, to challenge our co-pilot, I said, can you, can you drop each chapter into a GPT called PDF Insight and let PDF Insight and analyze it? What you discovered is the, um, the amount of material required by each author in each chapter often exceeded 7,000 words, which meant 
<laughs> that, that, that the AI could not interpret it. And, and it was really handy to know that you could actually defend the regurgitation of information through an AI by ensuring a 7,000 word count on each chapter. So that's just a side note that we discovered uh, when using it. But like I said, I didn't want to say we're desecrating the book. And as I showed you in that short video, Catherine, the one we got didn't have all the pages cut. So the students, some of the students actually had to go through to read the chapter, put their fingers in the page and unscore the page. It was, I did videos of this. I said, it's the first time you've actually made the book as a reader <laughs> as you opened the pages. So we did that during about three weeks of our um, semester. And I had to say it was, a, it was an active learning exercise uh, to watch it happen. Very cool. Well, Bernie, what I think you touch on, it's really important. It, you know, when things are open, the ability to take people through how knowledge is constructed mm -hmm. goes way up. And especially if you're working with people who are going to research things, getting them to understand how knowledge is built, you know, mm -hmm. this on top of this, on top of this, on top of this is is really essential. And, and that's very, very hard to do when people run constantly into paywalls and, and other things like that. And it defeats that whole process of, yeah. of actually, of, really it defeats the process of attribution, which scholars tend to claim is so important. Um, because, you know, half the grad school papers and traditional things or things where people haven't read any more of the article than the title, mm. um, you know, in their, yeah. in their I libraries. You, and like I said, if you go from the back to the front, like you go from the supporting elements, the bibliography, to the titles, to the subheads in the chapter, to the to the pull quotes, um, you know, it's a backwards look at, you know, what was in that chapter, what did the author mean? And um, it's a rigor, uh, it's a rhetoric. A process of it actually, um, Catherine, your book probably provided the first exegesis for my fourth year students. They didn't, they had never had to go deep, that deep, um, in the structure of what did the author mean or the examples that were being shown in the passion for open education. So, uh, very interesting. I, I'm thinking about um, packaging what that, what we did, and then OER and that to say, look, here, if you want to have someone take apart a book, and use tools that they're as simple as the ones that are in their hand. Uh, so as a byproduct of this, just so you folks know, you probably do know this, the entire book that Catherine Lahr published is a PDF, which makes it easy to break down what I did. But um, some of the students use their phone as scanners and scan the, their pages in to make sure they could get it down to one megabyte, which then allowed their phone to interrogate it using an AI. So anyway, all these things are technical for if you're trying to do it. And a, a secondary school student can do this. Uh, and their teachers need to be showed. Maybe they don't want to do it, have the kids do it. But the teacher, the kids are going to be using AI to pervert education. So no, no, we're going to teach you how to use AI as a kind of like a academic forensic consultant to figure out, I set the standard for what you're meant to read. You're going to write the essay back so it's fit, it fits for what you have to have in the leaving, but we're going to also take it apart much faster than we could typically do it in the classroom by you answering the following 88 overhead questions. <laughs> Go ahead and use the AI if you want. But like Bernie, that is amazing. And I, I'd love to get a conversation with you and me and Laura to hear that. But Lou is yeah. sitting here with her hand up and she's one of the yes. authors. And so I'm dying to know what, she, <laughs> what you have to say, Lou. Thanks, Bernie. How fascinating. Um, thank you. And thank you, Catherine. I, I wanted to speak a bit about the process of being an author because you're right, Catherine. Open, mm -hmm. we think of it as resources. It is obviously pedagogy, but it's also mm -hmm. systems and processes. And the process of being an author was an open process. And that was really fascinating. And I've been doing quite a bit of work with systems thinking um, in a sort of, you know, environmental green space and with change makers. So with change makers, Mags, I'm going to say the P word, potential, that change making energy. We don't want to lose that. We want to keep a closed loop so that we marshal that energy to where it can make change. 
but at the same time, the principles of open are even there in the closed loop of that, that joyful loop of the system, because there's something for me that really speaks to human values of humility and not knowing and unknowing and unlearning in such a such a very volatile world that we having to let go of such a lot of stuff and um it's been inspiring coming here tonight because mags i just saw your tweet earlier and i thought will i get home in time yes i will and so it's a complete spontaneous thing to just be able to be in the space with you but i'm doing a lot of development of resources as part of the green change makers program and um, we're meeting together in a couple of weeks and I'm going to be doing some work with them on this so that we make our stuff safe. We can't future proof anything, can we, in this world, but we can at least make it a little safer for the future. So thank you so much, everybody, and particularly Kate and Mags and, and Catherine for just always providing a right big hug. Thank you, Lou. That makes it all all this work mags all year makes it, it worth it and i think we were we were right to uh maybe consider closing off the academic uh calendar year with, with this session more than anything and we were we were jokingly before everyone came in that that was a a mighty fine waiting room of of names that were waiting to come to the session so it's uh it, it's been wonderful for us as well and just to even echo on the the authoring process I was you know very much in the same space where you're creating resources and helping others to create resources and you know considering kind of within limits licensing your own work and being part of larger projects but it was a completely different experience to consider the authoring process and like in in my own case collaborating on a kind of professional level the project team was one thing but my my co-collaborator on the other project on the other chapter was someone that we met, you know, someone that I met, Claire Thompson, from, you know, open spaces like this and getting to know in those spaces and working, you know, it, I suppose through that process with other authors to support. It's just, it's a really interesting thing that we haven't really had a chance to reflect on yet, Catherine. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> Does anyone else want to come in? I know a couple of people. Yeah, I, I just to... want to throw one in, say, from Adrienne's and my my point of view from the the textbook bound second level education system we'll be 10 years behind every you know all 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 of 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 you in terms of adopting open oer oep however we're 10 years ahead in terms of all you know often sharing without doing any ccing or attributing in a good way and a bad way we get no attribution I see my stuff from the time I was in the PSTE my stuff I see my stuff all over the place and I'm going oh, I should have you know I should have put a cc on it it doesn't matter I don't care but I think we're in a really really funny place in that we could be doing amazing OER and OEP sharing Adrienne I don't know how you feel about it but we're really our exam system has us the books are written for the exams you know we're really tied into a closed a closed system um yeah i would agree with you mags in a lot of ways um i have to be careful here since i authored two books or a series of books that are yeah, but because of a need be because in, of a need for for <laughs> But um, I think one of the issues that arises very much for, that I would see that as being problematical is simply just time. I'm sure it arises in other contexts as well. And the current, the, the day and the week within the secondary school that it's currently structured doesn't actually allow or recognise the, the uh, space that's required for this resource making if it's to be effective and not just a swapping of notes. If it's to be deeper than that, if it's to be something that um isn't just one person who is great at doing this stuff we let them do it and off you go and just share it has to be more i think of a mentality within an environment and where somebody doesn't get loaded with stuff i think that's an important thing because as we've all seen in education increasingly there's an awful lot of paperwork that's not necessarily 
what we want to do in class, if that paperwork was more about creating resources that can be mutually beneficial, dynamic, um, and bringing everybody along with it, and yet allowing teachers bring their own personality into their teaching of a topic, which I think is always the richness there, um, I think we're going to be struggling a bit because it's 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 yeah. that it may always seems to win out development of resources. Oh no, a teacher can just do that. Oh yeah. Oh no, no, don't need textbooks. Create your own resources. But you know, there is a time element yeah. and there's a commitment, and it needs a bit of a structuring around it within the school system. And um, that would be my only observation on it. Um, and like that, I think even if you look at how people use textbooks, they usually use them quite creatively, as in, oh, not, not interested in this, but this is the way I'm going to do it. That's a basis for that. Um, I, I, I certainly would never have been a slave to the book myself, but it did provide some somehow for students something to hold on to. And we are familiar with the, the students who are maybe uh, tech only schools and yet for some students they actually physically like to have a book you know which it it creates it well it doesn't create problems but it's part of the discussion and not and not to be forgotten within that but definitely and um, the whole idea of the openness and sharing I think for most people in education if you're that's where you want it always to go that's part of the spirit of the teacher whether it's and I think whatever it level you're at yeah. it, it's just let's do it together let's share oh I got this I got that and it, this is more kind of not formalizing it but saying it's valid it actually should be at the center of what we do rather than peripheral to what we do I think Ceci Ceci by its nature we we are open to embracing and we probably could help in educating teachers on what Catherine has helped us with tonight attribution as well but Absolutely. you know um if if we knew more about how to to do that properly I think Kate it's something we could we could address with, with with within the next year and then people people are going to do open resources in a way that can be shared mm. Yeah, I think people are entitled mm -hmm. to get to be acknowledged for what they do. Mm -hmm. you know, and as you say, Mag, your work is appearing everywhere and it's no no assignment to it or anything like that. No mind. Um, I know. I do think it I do think it is. <laughs> it, it, is I know. it is nice. It is nice to have it and to, to acknowledge the work that goes on. But I do think the uh, somebody I think was it Bernie made the point about the AI and this hoovering up of stuff regardless and all of that sort of thing i think that's that's very pertinent that hadn't struck me but yes very pertinent um that's i'm grateful for all everyone has said and adrian what you said just about second level really yeah hits home and i'm just my brain is spinning about ways that could support second level educators and sessi and what you said mags one of the things that was reflected back to me over many years is that just the power of modeling, like if your stuff is out there and you put a Creative Commons license on it, people will be like, oh, what's this? Oh, I could do this. You know, it becomes another level of educating people, you know, just by sending stuff out there with the CC license. Like the number of people that said to me over many years, you know, oh, I didn't really understand about licensing, using openly licensed images in my presentations, but I noticed you always do it. You know, you always put the the CC, the sure, attribute yeah. the person and say where you got it and put the CC license. And it's, you know, it's just part of my practice, but I realized that by modeling it, by doing it, it's just amazing the way it, it becomes something that signals for other people that this is an option. Yes, and it's even as simple as setting examples for colleagues. I, you know, I, in my own context, obviously, I learned pretty much everything I know from you, Catherine, and and you know, you modeling that within within our unit, within within Kilt and Galway, and I've tried to do that with my own colleagues now, and it is a piece of work to kind of consciously license everything you're doing, but it also makes if if you're trying to instill this into others, and if it's part of our plan, Mags, you know going forward with SESI, it's also making people think about their intellectual property and consider who they're sourcing and where they're sourcing from. And that there's there's an awful, there's a lot of layers there in terms of that ownership and, and also making people, you know, there's a certain sense of pride 
in our work too, that how many times do we throw together resources for a workshop or a slideshow or, or a set of things, but we don't consider them OERs. And I know in our sector, you know, or in higher ed, certainly anyone else can attest, you know, a lot of OER gets just conflated with textbooks when mm. that's not, you know, that's not what it is. It's, you know, it could be any, any little thing at all, at all. Mags, you have your hand up, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Can I check in with Connor? You said something cryptic at the start, which is probably it, it might be to do with this about, you know, meanings of open and open is as open does or open says. Am I? Yeah, you, I mean, I, 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 ne Mags, I never set out to be cryptic, you know, but I just tend to sort of do that sort of thing without um yeah I, I, it, the context really is a conversation an ongoing conversation i'm having currently um with some some um i'm going to say the word i'm sorry policy makers you know um both both on the island and and, and a little bit beyond it and um some some colleagues will know that I, I have to be very very careful about my wording here some colleagues will know that i've been involved <laughs> recently in terms of some development work in relation to um second level curriculum let's mm -hmm. kind of put it like that and it's a novel subject area <clears throat> it's coming on stream pretty soon it's been the most amazing conversations in the background about this whole area of you know opening and different types of assessments and and, and so on and it is constantly i won't say being railroaded and and, and but <clears throat> it constantly comes back to examination and I'm not one to always say, you know, that the examinations drive the system, but the most interesting of conversations have kind of come to an abrupt halt because yeah. someone steps forward and says, well, how do we actually assess this within the framework of the Leaving Cert? And once that comes into play, the, the, you know, a lot of the kind of dynamic goes out of the thing. Now, I'm not, I'm not being critical overly, I think, of colleagues. It's just it, it's it's a, a reality that I'm only discovering for my myself for the first time. And what I'm looking at is hardwiring um not quite a hostility hardwiring a cynicism towards openness and towards change and towards all of those you know issues to do with equity and access and everything else into the system um at the very level of subject specification that scared me and it frightened me and i've never experienced it before so that's 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 one part of the context max it's kind of so that's kind of on the rock but beyond the rock i'm involved in a number of, of projects as well and one of the terms and conditions under which we were funded was that we would produce quote unquote open and accessible resources okay i have had the mother of all battles with people at the community, uh, the, 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 well, well, at the level of the funders of these European projects, to actually even get them to look at things like um, OER Commons. I mean, and, and I'm finding this quite extraordinary because, you know, one part of the system is driving us towards everything being open, everything being com Commons driven, and everything else. And then you go into their own websites and you see things like the House of Europe. Fabulous yeah. site. I don't know if you know it. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with that particular site. It's a lovely, lovely site. I, I probably don't have. Let me just give me one second to see if I. It's usually in my um. Yeah. Let me let me let me show you something. If I may, uh, I'll just pop it into the chat rather than than anything else, and people can have a look at it afterwards and have a have a think. Okay, this is um a, a resource that's been built on huge amounts of public money. Um, at the European level. It's a repository of absolutely fantastic pieces of art um, spanning, you know, the, the decades and everything else. And you click on something like that and the very, very first thing you find at the, you know, it, it's it's high res. It's all of those things that Catherine was mentioning. It's good quality. And you scroll to the bottom of the page and you see copyright EU. And I mean, you know, and and and, and, and this is this is one half of the house. And the other half of the house is telling us that everything we produce must be accessible, must be open. Uh, but it's it's kind of, you know, they're 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 exercising the pattern, they're going through the wording. The reality of actually making something truly open in terms of practice, making something open in, in terms of content is very, very challenging. And I think we we underestimate that. You know, we're in a room where people are, you know, reasonably comfortable with these concepts and reasonably comfortable with elements of its practice. But there's an awful lot of people out there that 
are not so. Now, I didn't mean to be cryptic or, 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 or cynical, but maybe that's just what I am, Mags, you know, so I'm sorry. <laughs> No, 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 no. It wasn't. A, it wasn't. A, it wasn't a negative invite. It was just. I. It stuck in my brain, and I wanted yeah. to. And I'm glad you well, brought that, it that's, back. That's that's the context because I. I, yeah. I. And that's one of the reasons I came to this session tonight, just you know, to hear Catherine um talk to these yeah. issues, because uh, you know the more the more the more I think about them, the better it is for me on a personal level. Yeah, this point you've made of of mm. leading, you know, people people at the top of the scale who should be starting with attribution and and access. Yeah. Yeah. Not even understanding yeah, yeah. what it means. Yeah, yeah and using that, but, but still not being not being kind of you know I won't say ashamed, but not being embarrassed about using the language, and you know the exhortations are all there, but not going sort of much beyond that. Okay, that's that's me. I'm I'm here to learn tonight, and I've learned a huge amount. So thank you all, colleagues, and you know um, it's it's always uh, it's always wonderful mm -hmm. to sit in these Michael. rooms and and hear yeah. stuff. If I can throw one thing in, I threw it into the into the chat. Pam Moran and I are working with um, the state of Nevada and in, in the U.S. and trying to. Their first thing was to develop the, uh, you know, what they call a portrait of a learner. But then, how do you, you know how do students say I've achieved this, and how do schools start to measure this and. Um, it's really an attempt to switch um, assessment in the second level, especially to I can statements. So instead of taking a test, the student can say, I couldn't do this before, but now I can. I didn't know this before, but now I do. And how do you show that to your community, not just to somebody who's going to give you some sort of grade on that or something like that. And um, what I guess I'm most proud of, and it's not my work, it's the work of a whole bunch of people, but when they were asked to come up with a, you know, a portrait of a learner, they just asked, they, they said the portrait should be questions to students. And the first question is, you know, how will I thrive? How do I build and sustain relationships? you know, which is such a different way of going at how we say people have accomplished something in school than what we do. That's powerful, Ira. Wow. Catherine, thank you for your time on this. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hate to leave this conversation. No, thank I, you, Catherine. It's I, it's it's great to learn. Well, you know, it's together. It's, like, it's yeah, it's together. It's the togetherness. That's what I'm saying. Like hearing the challenges that everybody has and the ideas. It just like it stretches me every time I talk about this, and particularly with a group like this. So whoever took that screenshot, I want that screenshot. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll give it to Kate, and she can email it out. Okay. All right. Love you all. And thank you too, Catherine. Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Thanks very, very much. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.